We'll turn to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. This weekend we're going to look at the life of Samson. Samson was the last of what we would call uh, a major judge. He was the last of the major judges. We've been looking at the book of Judges and watching what I call the sin cycle of insanity. Okay, uh, During the time of the judges, Israel got stuck in this ridiculous pattern of turning away from God, and then they would be oppressed by their enemies, and then they would cry out to God for rescue. Of course, God would deliver them through a person, through one of the judges. Israel would experience a season of rest and peace, and then they would turn away from God again. They would repeat the pattern. And every time that they repeated the pattern, they spiraled down. Their sin got worse. Their oppression got worse. Even the character and the choices of the judges that God used to deliver the people got worse. As you can see in this chart, starting with Othniel, ending with Samson, everything is just spiraled down. In fact, um, two things I want you to know before we jump into the story of Samson are, one, this was Israel's longest season of oppression. They were oppressed by the Philistines for 40 years. This was by far the longest that they had been oppressed during that uh, season of the judges. So the second thing I want you to know is that Samson <laughs> is the only judge Israel did not cry out for. Like Israel wasn't asking to be delivered. Why is that important to know? Because that means that Israel had gotten comfortable in their oppression. Like they had gotten used to it. They had, they had come to terms with it. We are their slaves. They are our masters. This is our life. This is, this is life for us. So Samson was a judge in a season where Israel was effectively saying, don't judge me. <laughs> Don't tell me what I should do better or want better for myself. I like my life just the way it is because this is my truth. Does that sound familiar? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> like they didn't even want to be delivered anymore. And this is by far the greatest threat that Israel ever faced elimination, not by extermination, but by assimilation. Do you guys know what assimilation is? Assimilation is basically settling into the way of living of a culture that is willing to embrace you. The Philistines were willing to embrace them just, a month, just enough. We were, were ruling over you, but we will embrace you. And Israel assimilated. They settled into the way of living of the Philistines. This is exactly what, where Israel was at. They were at their worst. And it wasn't necessarily because their sin had got any grosser. Their sin was about as gross as it could possibly get. It's because of how comfortable they had gotten with their compromise. A commitment was only a commitment as long as it was comfortable. A conviction was only a conviction as long as it as it was convenient. And I want to give you this whole sermon in one sentence this morning, and that's this. Be careful not to let your commitments and your convictions be continually compromised by comfort and convenience. And the title for the message this weekend is Conquering Compromise. That's what we want to do. We want to conquer Compromise. We've all been there. We've all not been careful to let our commitments and our convictions um, be compromised by comfort and convenience. We've all been there. Here's what I love about God. God wants to deliver us. Say that. God wants to deliver me. That was kind of that. You need to know that. God wants to deliver you. So say it one more time. God wants to deliver me. Listen, even if we don't know that we need to be delivered, even if we don't want to be delivered, Israel didn't cry out for a deliverer during the season, but God sent them one anyway. Amen. 
Judges chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture. This is three chapters of his story. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it fast. I've had just enough cups of coffee to help me do that. <laughs> starting in verse 1, it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. So he delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, there was a man named Manoah whose wife was barren and had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, you're going to have a baby and it's going to be a boy. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You're going to become pregnant. You're going to give birth to a son and his hair must never be cut for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. Okay, let me stop really quick and explain to you what a Nazarite is. In Hebrew, there's a word, it's Nazir, and it means to be separated or to be consecrated. So a Nazirite is someone who, for a season of their life, they make a vow of consecration. A man or a woman could vow themselves to be separated from what is common. Okay, Judges, I'm sorry, New, uh, Numbers chapter 6 talks about uh, a few things that a Nazarite would do or rather not do uh, as a commitment of consecration. For example, they couldn't have wine. A Nazarite was not to have wine during their season of consecration. Uh, not even grapes, not even raisins. Like you couldn't eat grapes or raisins. No wine, no grapes, no raisins. You could not cut your hair. And you couldn't go near a dead body, okay? Now, this, this uh, vow could be for a season. Jewish tradition says that the, the shortest amount of time that you could actually make a Nazarite vow was 30 days. So if you're going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to make a vow of consecration to the Lord, I'm going to give up those things. Well, you can't do it for any less than 30 days. A Nazarite could also be a Nazarite for life. They could make this commitment of consecration for life. And this is what God wanted for Samson. A lifetime of being set apart or consecrated for God. Now, we've been talking about how Israel's story, the story of the judges, the season of the judges is our story. Well, now we're looking at Samson, and we know that Samson's story is our story because we've been set apart, right? We've been separated. We've been consecrated for life. The world is all about these things and those things. And we used to be about those things, but we're not anymore. We've been called by God. He has saved us. He has set us apart. And by putting our faith in Jesus, we've made a vow to consecrate ourselves to God for his plans and for his purposes. And for how long? Forever. That's right. For life. I heard somebody say, I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. When you give your life to Jesus, it is an indefinite amount of time. It's forever. Amen. And he promises to continue setting us apart and doing his work in us until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He doesn't give up, which motivates Tony not to give up. Amen. Samson was called a Nazarite, called to be a Nazarite for life. Verse 6 says, so the woman came and told her husband, saying, some guy just came to me and told me we were going to have a baby. And that he was going to be set apart for life as a Nazarite. And so Manoah said, girl, what you been drinking? Because she was barren. What are you talking about? You are seeing stuff. You're seeing craziness. Manoah prays and asks God to send the man again. The angel of the Lord does show up again. And Manoah says, tell me what you told her. And it says that the angel of the Lord repeats his instructions. And now they've both heard the message. Say that. They both heard it. Say it. They both heard it. Hey, both of them heard it. Okay. Now Manoah is excited. I mean, he's about to have a kid. Baron, his whole marriage. Now he's going to have a baby boy. And so he wants to celebrate. He wants to honor this messenger. And so he invites him to stay for lunch. And in verse 19, it says, Manoah took a young goat a grain offering, and offered them on a rock to the Lord. And as Manoah and his wife looked on, the Lord did a marvelous thing. When the flame went up from the altar to the sky, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell down onto the ground. 
And when the angel of the Lord did not appear to them ever again, Manoah realized that it had been the angel of the Lord. And Manoah says, we're going to die. Because <laughs> when you see the Lord, right, you're going to die. We gonna, maybe we're going to die. And she's like, really? He just comes to us and makes us this amazing promise of blessing. Has lunch with us and we're going to die. Typical man, right? And typical wife <laughs> trying to talk him off the ledge. Judges chapter 14, we're getting into a new chapter, and it says that one day, so Samson's older, one day Samson was in Timnah. One of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Samson, is there not someone in your own tribe or at least someone that is actually an Israelite that you can marry? Why you got to go over here to these pagan Philistines and find a wife? Remember, God told the people not to intermarry with, with um, the inhabitants of the land. He said, don't marry those people. So mom and dad had a right. They were right to call him out on uh, what he wanted to do. Samson never should have even given that thought the time of day. Okay, It was compromising. But Samson told his father, Get her for me. She looks good to me. And verse 4 says this. His father and mother didn't realize that the, that the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines who ruled over Israel at that time. Now, really quick, I, I want to point this out. Just because it says that the Lord was at work in this, creating an opportunity to work against the Philistines, that doesn't mean that we ignore the obvious, to me at least, elephant in the room. I won't give you a Hebrew lesson, but let me just tell you that, you know, we translate this, uh, get her for me. She looks good to me. That's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words. Get her for me. She looks good to me. But there's actually only two words there in Hebrew. It's the word lachach and yashar. Get to be pleased. When Samson's parents object to Samson's demand, Samson essentially says, do it. It's what I want. And you'll notice the exclamation point. If you look in your Bible, there's an exclamation point. So this would actually read, do it. I want it. And does that stand out to anybody? Okay, we're going to come back around to this. Okay, look at verse 5. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, why are they going to Timnah? Because Samson got his way. Like I said, we'll come back to that. A young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At, the moment, at that moment, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaw apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat, but he didn't tell his father or mother about it. I want you to notice two things. One, Samson was traveling separate down to Timnah from his parents. Not the end of the world. Nothing intrinsically wrong with that. Not a terribly big deal. The second thing I want you to notice is that the path that he chose to take was near the vineyards of Timnah. I mean, the writer did not have to include that detail. Why did he? Maybe it's another way of, tr of giving us a clue as to understanding Samson's character. Samson was an Azurite and had no business going anywhere near those grapes, right? Maybe Samson was compromising his commitment and conviction for the sake of comfort and convenience. Now, we've got a lot more to read, but I want to give you some life lessons from Samson, okay? Lessons from the life of of Samson. And let me go ahead and give you this first one. Keep away from compromise. Listen to me, saints. I'm trying to encourage you and build you up this morning. Keep away from compromise. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober minded and alert. Don't be aloof. Don't be aloof. La, 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 la. Be sober minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Maybe that's what this whole scene is meant to teach us. 
allowing yourself to get too close to things you're supposed to be set apart from gives the devil an opportunity to pounce on you. And just because Samson defeated this lion easily does not mean that you are going to win every time. The best to steer clear of compromise. Not if you understand what I'm saying. Anyone ever wondered why Samson never told his parents that he killed that lion? I mean, I would have told him and I would have worked it. Do we have anybody else in the house that embellishes stories? I mean, come on, you're going to kill a lion and not tell anybody about it? Not going to tell your parents about it? I would have said, y'all, I-, I killed this giant lion. It was massive. The biggest lion you ever saw. I would have worked it. My guess is Samson didn't tell his parents about the lion because he had con- come in contact with something dead, which is against the Nazarite vow. Now, the thing is, is when you read in Numbers chapter 6, there is provision if you do accidentally, by chance, come into contact with something dead. God's gracious, right? He, he, he leaves a, a way to, to make things right. And so you would have to go through some ceremonial cleansing. Several different things. One of the things that you would have to do is you'd have to start over with your hair. You have to cut it off. You'd have to shave it. Okay, ceremonial cleansing, taking the time to do that, meant a change of plans. It meant he would have to delay his trip to Timnah. Ceremonial cleansing also meant that he he was going to lose his hair. Well, we know because we'll read it later in the story that Samson knew his strength came from his hair. And he wasn't about to lose his strength. Bottom line, this whole situation for Samson was a big, fat inconvenience. And so once again, we see Samson compromising his commitment and his convictions for the sake of comfort and convenience. It goes on in verse 7. It says, when Samson arrived in Timnah, he talked to the woman and was very pleased with her. Later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, okay, so the wedding's on, getting my way. Later, when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, he turned off the path to look at the carcass of the lion. And he found that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. He scooped some of the honey into his hands and ate it along the way. It's like, Samson, bro, you are a Nazarite. What are you doing? You're not even supposed to come near a carcass, much less eat something out of it. And it's gross, by the way. Several layers of weird, right? To me, though, this is also another clue as to why Samson would have traveled so close to that vineyard. I personally believe that Samson was snacking on the grapes. Why else would they put that detail in there, right? Samson was either an idiot or he was rebellious. He may have been both. It says he gave some of the honey to his mother and his father and they ate it. But he didn't tell them he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. Of course he didn't tell them. If he told them, again, he would have to go through the cleansing ritual, the ceremonial cleansing. He didn't tell them. What did he tell them? Where did he tell them he got that honey? Whatever it was, it would have been a lie. True? Yeah. He churched it up. Whatever he told them was a churched up version of what happened. Here's the second thing I want to tell you. A lesson from the life of Samson. Don't church up your choices. Don't church up. Anybody ever churched up their choices? You know what I'm talking about? Well, you know, the reason I did that is because, you know, sometimes whenever I'm with, I just felt like, and God, when God speaks to me, you know, well, God, it was, and the way that my relationship with God works, you know, sometimes it was just blah, 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 right? That's not the way it works. Don't church it up. Don't try to make it sound better than it was. That was a bad choice. Don't church it up. If it's not true, it's a lie. And listen, it affects the people around you because you pull them into that lie, just like Samson did with his parents. 
You cause people, when you church it up and don't tell the truth, fluff it up. You cause people to enter into your defilement. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but it's not good. Don't church up your choices. Let's keep moving and let's pick up the pace. Can you all pick up the pace with me? Yeah? Can you do it? Okay. So Samson gets engaged to this Philistine gal and then he throws a party. At the party, Samson gambles with 30 men by giving a riddle. Okay. If this, this story, man. If the men at the party can solve the riddle, Samson is going to give them 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. If they can't solve it, they give him 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of, fe of festive clothing. Can you imagine you got a poker tonight at your house? Got the guys over. All right, tonight, what's the stakes, boys? And you go, I was thinking maybe we could stake our bathrobes. <laughs> That'd be the last time all the guys come over for poker. <laughs> right? That's weird. The whole thing's weird. It says, all right, they agreed. Let's hear your riddle. And so he said, they agreed to it, by the way. It's like, oh, weird. The whole scene. So he gives a riddle. Out of one who eats came something sweet. Out of the strong came something sweet. Three days later, they were still trying to figure out this riddle. So these 30 men, several days later, still can't figure out the riddle. And so they go to his wife and they tell her, we need you to find out what the answer to this riddle is. Otherwise, we're going to have to give up all of our bathrobes. She says, they say, if you don't, we're going to burn your father's house down. And so they threaten her. And so she goes to Samson, finds out the answer to the riddle, and she tells the 30 men the answer to the riddle. It says in verse 18, So before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town came to Samson with their answer. What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? Samson replied, If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. I want to give you another lesson from the life of Samson. This one is specifically for the men. Never, ever refer to your wife as a heifer. <laughs> ever. You go to Canton Trays Day, you want to buy her something real nice, never come home with this. Okay? Don't do it. It will not go well for you. I'm trying to help you out, men. Been married for 28 years. Samson replied, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. And it says that the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Samson goes and he kills 30 other men, steals their clothes so that he could pay off the 30 men that he lost to. Okay, so now Samson is a mobster, right? I mean, this is Godfather all over again, right here. It says that he was so mad that he leaves his wife and he goes back home to live with his mom and dad. And his wife ends up marrying his best man at the wedding. Judges 15 opens up with Samson going back to see his wife. I guess he thought about it, went back. He wanted to be with her. But her father had already given her in marriage to Samson's best, best man. And Samson was ticked. I mean, he was just ticked. It says, Samson says, this time I cannot be blamed for everything I'm going to do to you Philistines. Verse 4, he says, then he went out, caught 300 foxes, tied their tails together in pairs, and he fastened a torch to each pair of tails. Then he lit the torches and let the fox run through the grain of the fields of the Philistines. He burned all their grain to the ground, including the sheaves and the uncut grain. He also destroyed their vineyards and olive groves. Y'all, that is next level crazy. When you consider all the things you would have to do and how long it would take to accomplish this goal, like for me, I'd have given up after trying to catch one fox. Like those suckers are sly, like a fox, right? This is next level, whacked out, crazy. The Philistines find out that it was Samson and they kill Samson's ex-wife and her father, who are also Philistines. This makes Samson even angrier, and so he retaliates again. And it says that he ruthlessly, ruthlessly, didn't just kill him, he ruthlessly killed a lot of men. Okay, I want you to listen to me. Samson was an un uh, unbridled person. 
Samson was an unbridled person. And we know that God used Samson to stir things up. We get that. This was all part of the way God would deliver Israel. But this guy's anger and passions were out of control. It says, he attacked the Philistines with such a great fury and he killed many of them. Then he went to live in a cave in the rock of Etam. It goes on and says that the Philistines came after him. And it's a long story, but this story is familiar to us. We're familiar with the outcome. A thousand men come after Samson. I love this picture. When I think about how I'm going to deal with a thousand men, this is me. This is what I look like. I love that. Verse 15 says that he found a jawbone of a recently killed donkey and he picked it up and he killed a thousand Philistines with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. It goes on to say in verse 20 that Samson judged Israel for 20 years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. Okay, and it's safe to say that uh, he judged them while constantly compromising his commitments and his convictions for the sake of comfort and convenience. And we know that's the case because chapter 16 opens up with one day Samson went to the Philistines, Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. Okay, really quick, we all understand that, that God used Samson despite his sin, not because of his sin, right? I want y'all walking out of here with the right lessons. God used Samson despite his sin, not because of his sin. God's purposes for Samson were bigger than Samson himself, which should have been a motivator for Samson to be better, to do better, to pull it together, but he didn't. Samson spends the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there, so the men of Gaza plotted to kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight, and then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, lifted them up, bar and all, and he took them on his shoulders and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron, which was a long way. This guy, what? <laughs> right? And then we come to the, the most famous part of the story. Like, like most of us here probably know this. It's the story of his demise. It's the story of Samson and Delilah. It says in verse 4, some time later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, entice Samson to tell us what makes him so strong so we can overpower him. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me. Okay, so they bribe her. We'll give you all this money if you will just find out what makes him so strong. So she comes to Samson and says, please tell me. What makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Now, what Samson should have said is, that's none of your business. Heifer. <laughs> right? Why would you ask me that? Why do you need to know that? What you up to? But instead, Samson replies, well. I mean, you know, if you were to tie me up with seven new bowstrings that haven't been dried yet, I would become as weak as anyone else. So the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings. And she tied Samson up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house. And she cried out, Samson, the Philistines are here. But Samson jumps up, snaps the bowstrings as if they were yarn. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterward, Delilah said to him, you've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now, please tell me how you can be tied up securely. My question is, why are you still there, Samson? Why are you even having this conversation? I'd have been out like a scout on a new route. You know what I mean? I'm out of here. 
Samson replies, entertains this whole conversation. Well, if I were tied up with brand new ropes, that's what I meant, not the green things, the new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. So Delilah took some new ropes, tied him up, and then the men were hiding in the inner room again. Delilah cries out, Samson, they're here again. But again, Samson snaps the ropes from his arms as if they were threads. Then Delilah said, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. And Samson replied, what the heck? Well, if you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into fabric on your loom and tighten it with the loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. Now we know that he's still lying to Delia. Delilah, but did you notice how close he's getting to the truth? Huh. This comes to the fourth thing and I want to teach you from the life of Samson. If you stay, you will pay. When you are in a situation where the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, maybe you messed up once, but you stayed. So the Holy Spirit speaks louder and then you stay again. And he speaks louder because he always does. He always gives us a way to escape. He speaks to us. That's what the Holy Spirit's, one of his main jobs in our life is to convict us of sin. And we choose to stay. Like we said a couple of weeks ago, it won't be long before you pay. If you stay, you will pay. You got to go. Get out of there. Samson, what are you doing? So while he slept, Delilah does this to his hair. Again, she cried out, Samson, they're here again. But this doesn't take away his strength either. So Delilah starts to pout. Okay, now she's getting ridiculous. She tormented him with her nagging day and night until he was sick to death of it. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, woman. For I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as anyone else. And this time, intuitively, Delilah knows that he's telling the truth. And so she calls in a man to cut his hair, shave his head. And it says, she cried out again, Samson, the Philistines are here to capture you. And it says, when he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he did not realize the Lord had left him. I mean, I could rabbit trail on that phrase for another hour. I won't. But note that it said he did not realize that the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. I just want to pause and say this is exactly where compromise leads us. We all know this picture. This is where compromise leads us, blind and in chains. We all know this feeling, right? I mean, maybe not literally, but we have felt this emotionally. We've known this condition spiritually. This is where Samson's bridled, unrestrained actions led him. Walking around in circles. Can't see a thing. No hope. No purpose, just circling, expending energy. This may be what you're feeling right now. This is exactly where you're at in life, just going in circles. No purpose, nothing but pain, can't see a thing. I want to tell you there's hope. The hope is in Jesus. And that is the consistent message that we preach here at Soma Church. 
that Jesus is your hope. He is your answer. And if this is where you're at, you cry out to him. And he will deliver. And here's, I want to tell you something else. He's on his way to deliver you even before you cry out because he loves you. And he wants you with him. Amen. Most of us know how this story ends. Verse 20 says, 22 says, but before long, his hair began to grow back. The Philistine rulers had a great festival offering sacrifices and praising their God, Dagon. They said, our God has given us victory over our enemies, uh, enemy Samson. When the people saw him, they prayed, saw the idol Dagon. They praised their God saying, our God has delivered our enemies to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. Half drunk by now, the people demanded, bring Samson out so he can entertain us. And so they brought him out to amuse them. And they had him stand between these two pillars that were supporting the roof. Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, place my hands against the pillar that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Now the temple was completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers were there. There were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who were watching Samson amuse them. And then Samson prayed to the Lord God, Sovereign Lord, may, uh, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. And by the way, that's still him not quite getting the picture. It was never about him. He was called to help Israel. The purpose for what he was about to do still wasn't God's purposes. He wanted a revenge for them gouging out his eyes. Samson put his two hands on the two pillars that held up the temple, pushing against them with his hands. He prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistines' rulers with all the people. So he killed more people when he died that day than he did in his entire lifetime. Later, his brothers and other relatives went down to get his body. They took him home and they buried him. And that's the story of Samson. And what I want to do is I want to circle all the way back around to the beginning of his story. And I want to give you one more lesson from the life of Samson. Okay, now I want to warn you, what I'm about to say to you is going to offend many in this room. Okay, I want to be careful, and I'll try to say it carefully, but what I, I'm, I'm, I want to forewarn you, I'll give you my email at the end so that you can email me. I'm just telling you, are you with me? Remember, it said that one day Samson was in Timnah. One of the Philistine women caught his eyes, and when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Samson, isn't there somebody from your own tribe or at least an Israelite? Why you got to go down there and get one of them Philistine ladies? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. Do it. I want it. And they did. And what this gives us is a glimpse into the culture of their home. The culture of their home was a culture of compromise. Samson was most likely raised to get what he wanted when he wanted it. So here's the fifth lesson from the life of Samson I want to give you. You can't compromise with your kids. You can't compromise with your kids. You can't compromise your commitment to raise them with biblical values. You can't compromise when it's uncomfortable to uphold those convictions. You can't compromise. Samson, again, most likely learned how to compromise from his parents. 
before there was ever a woman that he wanted. There was a toy that he wanted or a snack that he wanted or something that he wanted to have that he wasn't supposed to have and the parents compromised. They caved. They gave in. Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The story of Samson is a perfect example of how important it is to train up your child in the way that he should go. Not in the way that they think they should go, right? Not even in the way that we think they should go. But in the way God says that our kids should go. In the ways that will cause our kids to grow up and be obedient and do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Because parents are distracted and aloof, tired, or lazy, or their worldview is clouded with some weird opinions of what parenting even looks like, whatever the reason is, instead of training their children, they are tolerating and enabling their children. And children have become the authority of the home. Like Samson. Do it. I want it. And parents are just bowing down to their kids. And that's the culture of the home. Maybe it wasn't laziness with Samson's parents. Maybe it was fear. I know a lot of parents that parent out of fear. Well, I, just, I just don't want to fail my kid. I don't want to fail my kid. I don't want to hurt my kid. I don't want to wound my kid. I don't want to fail my kid. Listen, the bigger failure was indulging Samson. Enabling his passions instead of helping him learn how to bridle them. Or maybe Samson's parents thought too highly of Samson's calling. This child is special. I mean, like, like this, our child is a miracle child. <laughs> Every child is a miracle child, by the way, right? That's the whole pro-life stance. But I get it. Some kids come to us in miraculous ways. Melissa and I consider our daughter to be a miracle child. But just because your kid is a miracle child doesn't mean he gets to run wild. You still with me? If your child is special, if they are a miracle all the more reason to dedicate them and your parenting to the miracle giver. God gave you that child. Amen? I want you to think about something. We're in the story of Samson. So God, God um, wanted to deliver Israel in a season where they weren't even asking for it. But God's good. And so in the heavenly realms, he thought of this plan. He thought of this child before he was in his mother's womb. He thought of Samson. The whole thing is supernatural. And then he comes to them and says, I'm going to give you a child. For her to have a child when she's barren is supernatural. So everything God was doing was in the supernatural. He was given supernaturally to these people. But God handed over the supernatural to the natural mom and dad. He said, train up this child in the way that he should go. They are going, he is going to deliver Israel. And from that point on, they are responsible for the man that Samson becomes. I personally do not believe that when God in the heavenly realm created Samson, he said, I am going to create a wreck. I am going to create a child that will not obey his parents and will not honor them. And is going to lead his own life in such a way that everybody around him suffers. I just don't think that's, that's it. 
He gave them a child that would have supernatural abilities and strength and said, bridle this stallion. I'm going to use him. So from the moment God handed the supernatural over in the natural to the parents, now everything, for the most part, that Samson becomes is about nurture. And I don't believe they nurtured him appropriately. And that's why he grew up and just could not bridle his passions. Parents, it is your responsibility to train up the child in the way that he goes. I know it's hard. It takes time. Sometimes you are tired. Sometimes you are weary. But it's important that you do everything that you can. You are responsible for your child. I don't know if we are understanding how important this is. And we have all our reasons why we are distracted and weary. Most of those things can be dealt with and go away so that we can give more attention to training our children. If we would just be more intentional about it. Did you know that your home could be more peaceful? It could. I know, I know parents who literally will not go out. Oh, we, I'm sorry, we can't go. Um, we, we can't go out with our child. Why in the world could you not go out to a dinner or out to a, an, an outing with your child? Because it's chaos and it's a nightmare. It does not have to be that way. Really quick, I want to give you a few things. I've given you this before. Back in 2020, we did a sermon series called Fight for the Family. Melissa and I did an interview. Pastor Joe interviewed us. And then I taught a week on husbands. Melissa did a week on wives. I did a, taught a week on fathers. Melissa did a week on mothers. And then I taught a message about parenting. The sermon title was called Get That, Chil uh, Get that Kid Down. So that was, that was the title of that sermon. I thought it was a funny sermon. Okay. But in that sermon, I gave, um, I gave five things. I'm going to give, give them to you real quick. I'm not going to go into near as much detail. But parents, I want to help you out. You may be here. You're like, yes, Lord. Pastor Tony, help. Help me. I'm going to give you a few things. If you're like, oh, my gosh, this is us. Our home is chaos. I love my kids, but God help them. Well, God will help them. And he'll help them through you. And this morning, through me. So let me give you five things really quick. You want a different culture in your home? Train your kid to look you in the eyes. A child that can't look an adult in the eyes, that's not good. It's typically a sign of authority issues. Train your kid to look in your eyes. Hey, look at me. When I'm talking to you, buddy, come on. If you got to guide their little chin, gently look at me. Look at me. I said, look at me. <laughs> Please stop doing that. Train your child to look you in the eyes. One of my favorite things these days when someone comes up to me and says, I was talking to your, your son the other day. That was such a great conversation. He's a good kid. Thank you. You know what I love most? What? He looks at me when I'm talking to him. Like, sure. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's awesome. You know what else they do? They say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. Train your kid to say, yes, sir. It's, an, it's, an, it's a Texas way of, saying, of giving respect. I think it's a universal way. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And we taught our kids this from the time they were babies, before they could even talk. Okay, pick up your block now, okay? Say, yes, sir. <laughs> before they could even mutter the words, they were, <laughs> all right, last bite. Here we go. Teach them to say, say, thank you. Teach them how to say yes, sir. And then when they don't say, what do you say? 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Now go to your room and clean it. Yes, sir. Thank you again. Amen? And when they say anything that's not respectful or disrespectful, deal with it. Dad, let me talk to you real quick. When your child is giving your wife grief and will not obey them, you get up off of your lazy boy recliner. And you say, son, look at me. That is my wife. And you will not talk to her that way. Do you understand me? <laughs> Did you know that's okay? That's not going to hurt your child. That's going to help your child. And when that child is a teenager, you won't have one that's pinning you up against the wall. The things I have seen and heard in family counseling. We don't know what to do. Unfortunately, you should have already done it. It's not too late because God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And he can redeem our poor choices early on. But now you have a work to do. And let me say it this way, parents. Pay now or pay later. Either way, you will pay. Pay now. Get up. Go across the room and say, Daddy said no. I know it's inconvenient. I know you were comfortable in front of your show. But that's what the child needs. Get up. Don't yell. Yelling doesn't do it, and counting doesn't work either. One, two. Some people count to three. Some people count to ten. The problem is, is you are giving them time to disobey. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Another problem with counting is they're not learning to obey right away, which I think is my next thing. Is that my next thing? No, we'll get there. Train your kids to know no-nos. There needs to be things in your life, in your home, in your family culture that are no-nos. That room may be a no-no. That um, item in the house may be a no-no. And that's okay. It's okay for them to hear no. No, you may not do that. No, you may not go in there. No, you may not kill your brother. Okay? It doesn't matter how, please, I just want to kill him. No. <laughs> Train your kid to know what no-nos are. If your kid does not know what a no-no is, that is a problem. Are you with me? A kid that cannot hear and deal with no. It's a problem. And it's going to be a big problem when they're a teenager. Do you understand? fourth thing is train your kids to obey right away. Obey right away. The counting thing doesn't work. Right away. To count and delay that. Listen, there are times when your no is imperative. Your no may, may be the, the difference between life and death. A lot of, can happen in three minutes. Uh, three seconds. Oh, definitely three minutes. <laughs> 284! <laughs> 285! How high are you going to go? They are clearly not getting the picture. In fact, they went down to the supermarket. They got a Slurpee. You're still over there counting. The difference between immediate and three seconds or ten seconds could be the life or death. They're running out into the road. They're running out in front of the car. They need to be able to stop as soon as they hear stop or no. Literally could be the difference between life and death. Teach them to obey right away. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. You can count all you want to. Well, that's our method. I'm, it doesn't work. I promise you. All you're doing is teaching them to delay the right thing. And when they grow up, guess what? God's calling them. God's convicting them. But they delay their obedience. They delay doing the right thing and going in the right direction. I've got time. 
God's not a fan of delayed disobedience. The last thing is train your kid to understand that there will be consequences. If your kid doesn't know what a consequence is, that's a problem. Life is full of consequences. Has anyone figured that out? There's consequences for your action. If you don't learn that with a kid, you don't know how to function as an adult. We're not doing our kids any service by not training them in the way that they should go. Now, I know what some people are thinking. Dial in. Let me go ahead and give you my email address right now. Tony at somatyler.org. I say this carefully, but I know what some people are thinking. Well, Pastor Tony, you know, my kid has been diagnosed with fill in the blank. I understand. And I have compassion for that. I really do. But I also want to encourage you. This should be an encouragement, actually. I want to challenge you and possibly even correct you on this. Your child was created by God, true or false. I mean, that's what we were celebrating this morning. God's ability to create a human. Your child was created by God. If your child has something, they've been diagnosed with something, then that means that God has allowed them to have it. True? Why would God purposefully give your child something that would keep them from obeying you and giving you honor? I don't believe that he would. Why would God bless you with this miracle child only to curse you later with chaos and craziness? I don't believe he would. None of that makes sense to me. I believe that every child has the ability to obey and honor their parent. We have seen many, many human beings go on to do spectacular things with all kinds of diagnoses. But something in their life propelled them in the right direction. Parenting, perhaps. I believe every child has the ability to obey and honor their parents. But a growing trend that I see is parents using their child's diagnosis as an excuse for being distracted. I'm just going to call it. Or an excuse for being lazy and not training their child. I want you to consider the difference between receiving a diagnosis. And I get it. Listen, I had stuff when I was a kid. Challenges. And I have four kids. I have four kids. I've lived this thing. I have one out of the house. That's a whole other level of challenge, right? And each one has their own unique challenges, things about them that make it challenging. I want you to consider this. If you've gotten a diagnosis, don't call it a diagnosis. Don't call it a diagnosis. Call it a discovery. We just discovered something about my child that's going to make parenting him more challenging. That's all it is. That's all it is. They still have the ability to grow up and honor you and love people. It may be more challenging. You may have more steps or two, but it is not impossible to raise that child up to be loving and obeying and honoring. Are you with me, saints? Don't call it a don't call it a diagnosis. Just refer to it as a discovery. We discovered something about Billy Bob. We discovered this. Okay. It's a challenge. But challenge takes time and it takes focus, doesn't it? Are you with me? T O N Y at S O M A Tyler. Org. Okay, I love you guys. And I know that, that there will be some that are upset about what I, especially just what I just said. But listen, you, you can't allow me to...
pastor you, coach you, encourage you, build you up, correct you in the realm of pornography and perversion and not allow me to correct you, encourage you, empower you in the realm of parenting. I want to build you up in every way that the Lord would show me and help to help you.